and um, and then we'll talk a little about it and let's hear your ideas about it. But this is the way I'm bringing them into the second day. Uh, oh, I didn't tell you the topic. This is what's so important. When she asked me to do this, the reason she asked me was because two of her teachers died and she has over 400 students and she had a big hole for what are we going to do with all the students for this rest of this period of days or whatever it was. And then I said, I will do this, but this time I need to know from you what it is these students want. They need to be asked or surveyed. And then she did, she surveyed them. What was the main point that our students wanted to be trained in? What did they want to understand? And it came back, this is a, a Meta into Life workshop. They wanted Meta to be explained to them how they can take it and in, in you know, weave it into their life and use it. So this is a big job because a lot of the terminology we teach um, from a teaching aspect, uh, their terminology is different. So we have to make sure they have certain knowledge for the six words that we use like met, uh, meditation, mindfulness, delusion, um, and uh, craving and purification of mind and retraining of mind. We, we did that in the first lesson. And um, they need to understand what the Buddha was doing when he was teaching meditation, how he was trying to teach them to look and uh, learn about how the phenomena arises and disappears, how, the, how everything works. So here we go with this. So now tonight, this tomorrow, nothing is, uh, I start by telling them at the top, nothing is happening to you. That should make somebody talk. <laughs> and everything is happening from you. This is something to observe and to learn from. So in Pointo section, Buddhism is about change. The first thing is, there's this saying among some of the higher, very elder teachers I met in Sri Lanka, and the Buddhism is always all about change. And if you truly want to change, then come and take a look at this. It is called the Buddha Dhamma. It is easy to understand for the patient and the wise. It is immediately effective, it invites deeper inspection, and it is untouched by time. And if it is not working, go back to what the Buddha taught in the very beginning, and you'll find uh, what was really meant, how it actually works. So that made sense to me when I heard it in the beginning. And if I remembered that if my car was broken down uh, and it wouldn't operate the way that the, they advertised when I bought it, well, then I would go and see if I could get it fixed at the local garage. Or if not, I would, they couldn't return it there, then I would take it back to the dealership I bought it from. And if they could not improve the operation then, well, I would go back to the factory where they made the car and find out why in the big manual that they keep when they designed the car. But in this simile, the factory represents the Buddha who isn't here to talk with us today. And that's true, but I can still go back to the manual to reread the lessons he taught and test them very closely for myself to see if they can work the way they are described. And this is what the Buddha advised his monks to do when he was gone. And if the teaching did not produce the results anymore, this is what they should do. So that is what we do at Dhammasukha Meditation Center and the, and the monastery in, in Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. And this, this was the path my teacher took for 12 and a half years while in Asia, sitting at the feet of many of the last great elder teachers before they were gone from Asia. And when I am teaching, what I am teaching you now is coming from the same suttas that he taught to his early monks. And uh, because this workshop is so short, we are not reading direct from the suttas this time, but this elegant tranquil wisdom insight meditation has been taught around the world now many times and there's still more will coming, who are coming to learn because of the help that it gives them in their lives and reducing of suffering and supporting, uh, you know, supporting us to see clearer and each even to reach the final truth if we so desire to go that far. So we, we take what we found in the texts 
and what is most helpful for better operation of our meditation with the goal of reaching path knowledge and completing a journey to the complete opening of our mind with full understanding of this Dhamma. Now, as a guide, we seek to share what we have learned and with anyone who wishes to reduce the suffering in this life. So the first next point is that, um, how does the change happen? The beginnings of his teachings, he searched for the power of change to support a wholesome direction in life, just like you wanna change your life. And to find balance in life, loving kindness supports opening your heart. Compassion moves this kindness into action. Empathetic joy is a beautiful happiness arising inside of us for another person's success. As parents, we taste this kind of feeling when our son or our daughter graduates from college for the first, their first degree and we're sitting there, we watch that's really something, you know. And hindrances, when, uh, when attention decides to move away from your spiritual friend over to the breath, this is out of habit, this is happening. Mind was accustomed to you practicing another way and it assumes that you must be wanting to get to the breath whenever you sit to do meditation. But just let it go and relax your mind, smile and come back to your friend and lightly see them in the, your mind like a picture smiling while you are smiling too. And very sincerely, take more interest in your friend. When you sit down and tell your mind you are going to do loving kindness meditation, you are training your mind not to be upset and just asking it to relax while you send this to a friend. That's all. There isn't any more to this. It isn't so complicated, but you have to talk to your mind. He's teaching you how to communicate with your mind to get a few things straight, like you are the one that is in charge and you decide what you're gonna do in your meditation and you're the one that's steering the ship through life. So how many times do we have to do the six R's to get free from suffering? As much as it takes to get mind to understand that you get to choose what you do whenever you sit in meditation. If you sit and 50 times your attention is pulled away and 50 times you do the six R's, this is, that's a good meditation. That's good work that you're doing. And if you are pulled away you, and you don't do the steps and you move away from your object of meditation, well, then that is a bad meditation. And uh, many times you have to you do this as many times as it takes for you to just sit down and begin and not be disturbed by any distractions. And you keep watching your friend and keep your smiling going and wishing them well until they smile back to you. Next one is coming up in the second day is how long until we feel joy? People start asking this sometimes right away. How long will it take for uplifted joy to come up practicing this way? They wanna know that. So you must stay with your friend for at least two to three minutes for the right condition to come up for uplifted joy, PT, to arise. Now, this is going by David's graph, and it's pretty good. That graph is on page, I think, 156 of his book, and uh, it's a pretty good diagram that he made there. Next question was, how will I know this is PT, joy? Well, you will smile and not know why you are smiling and uh, you are feeling this energetic joy inside of you and you're feeling light. And if you were to ask, I were to ask you, did joy arise while smiling? You would tell me yes. And if I asked you again, why are you feeling happy? You would simply say, I don't know. I just feel happy. And that is the uplifted joy, the light feeling, lightness in the head, and there's nothing bothering you as much as it was, and you, but you don't know why you're happy. That's what it is. So the next part is how do we use this practice when we take it into life? Can someone move around and keep on practicing metta? It's a good question. 
most certainly, yes. The question is, can you keep on smiling through your day? Can you forgive all frustrations you meet up with? Can you share your smiles at home, at school, at work? And since you know a Nietzsche is real, if you say you do, then you know whatever task that you are doing anytime, anywhere, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So there's no reason to do anything anymore with a sad sack face like it's forever weight on you. Because you can smile into everything as you do it with kindness to its end. And so you try it. This is the next thing. You need to try it. And you should take your friend with you when you do it too. The next question is, but how do you do it? The answer is funny. You just do it, <laughs> okay? You bring up determination. You set up intention. Then you do it for a day and you decide to keep it going and you leave behind all negative doubt and worrisome thinking. This is about understanding that you steer the ship uh, through life and no one else can carry you through this. You gather the knowledge about how everything works along the way and you decide each day how this will be. Sometimes people have never heard that they're in charge. Will you point it, uh, will you paint the day, I'm sorry, will you paint the day with bright colors or will it be dark and sad? This up to you, it's your canvas. You put it on the wall, it's white in the morning and you pretend to paint your painting and come back tonight and tell me what you painted for the day. Number three, there is only one sutta in the Majima Nikaya that is repeated four times in a row to four separate audiences. And it is the Badari Karata Sutta. The Bada Karata Sutta is important because with that, we balance our understanding clearly about what the past, the future, and the present time are. And before we look at how to use dependent origination as a tool in life, we need to review the balancing of, from this sutta first, because it sets the stage to see how things are working on the outside along this line before we go to see how things are working through the mind. And once you hear the Bhattacarata Sutta things, get a little bit clearer. And I've taught this to you guys before, but this is how it's being set up. And I can't believe I probably, let me see, I have to go down here and go look. This has not been fished through yet because we did some of it, but we did do all of it. So experience feeling meta one. Okay, next part is to talk to them. Are any of you feeling, uh, experiencing the feeling of meta? That one is wanting to move up into the head. If that's happening, we need to discuss what's happening with you. Um, as it goes up. And what we're trying to do is give them some idea of what happens when the meta moves up. It's a signal. And the next question is actually four or five questions. You know, the first question you ask is, is the person you're sending the meta to smiling back at you? That's the first question. And uh, the second question is it moved up in your head. Okay. Third question is, did you lose any feeling in any part of your body? Did you, usually starts with the, uh, the lot, you know, you, you lose feeling in your hands and then you lose it from the feet, it goes up the legs and then finally reaches the torso and sets the torso, um, can be the whole entire torso will disappear as you go into the fourth uh, jhana working down the path. Okay. Um, so we have to be able to tell them basically what will happen, but we have to make sure the biggest thing when we're teaching like this, I wanna emphasize if you share it with anybody and you get them started on this, when it feels like it's going to the head, you are going to run into some people who um, haven't felt anything in years and years if you're teaching an older person, especially, and maybe their heart has been from some trauma locked up and so now you've done the meta, taught them the meta, and then what happens is they 
don't want to let go of feeling in the heart. But for some reason, they're very quiet and the feeling wants to move up to the head, but they're pushing it down. Now, this is the one cautionary spot in teaching this practice. Don't let them do that. Make sure they understand. Do not try to control where the feeling is. It's very important. It needs When you started this practice, you were giving the heart a signal. I'm setting you free. You've been doing, I'm setting you free. And when you're setting it free, if it wants to move, you let it move. Because if you try to hold it down, uh, you can get pretty depressed and it can actually make you feel very sick and everything else. You have to be careful because it wants to go to the head. And then what's going to happen? The next question they're going to ask you when it goes to the head, the next remark is going to be from the student. You know, it moved up into my head. I thought that was okay. Then all of a sudden I realized there's just not that much power anymore. It's not as strong anymore. What's that telling you? It's changing into karuna because when it changes in karuna you can't say powerful and say soft like cotton you can't do that so when it's going up you know you have to uh moving up you have to just tell them that's nothing wrong with this you don't have to keep going back and make it stronger and come again because every time i had somebody do this like three times i didn't know about what to do and this is when i was first starting teaching going up and then losing power and then getting distressed, pushing it down, then building it up, coming up to the head, losing power, trying to get soft, trying to turn into a ballerina. And we want it to keep wearing pants and running the tractor and keep sending it back for more power. You know? And that doesn't work. It doesn't work. So everything that we're teaching you is about uh, balance and uh, fluent operation of the uh, meditation, everything. And so um, these are questions are coming up like this after only one day. And I tell you a secret, there are now two people who are talking about lightness in their body and they've only been doing this one day. And this is interesting because what they were practicing before they had, they were not told any information about what it meant if the body started to get light. See, when it starts to get light, it's starting to get free, like the butterfly is getting ready to come out of the cocoon and fly. Okay. That's what's happening. Okay. But they're identifying the lightness that's happening when it does, the conditions are right and the lightness starts to happening. They're labeling it numbness. And this brings back the memory of a woman in Sri Lanka at a retreat who came in, uh, an elderly woman, and she'd been working pretty hard for three days. And she came in, she said, I can do the interview, but I have to go and have, um, an EKG stat. So I have to get to the hospital right afterwards. And Bonte and I said, what, what's wrong? I don't know, but I'm losing feeling and it feels like I need to get my heart checked immediately. And this was when she did the description. It's coming in my hands. It's coming in my feet. It's creeping up my legs. It's creeping up my arms. And I looked at her and I said, that's wonderful. <laughs> and she went, what? And I said, it's wonderful because that means that the tension and tightness is draining out of your body. And I figure what happened with these two people in this workshop is they listened to me when I said, you have to, uh, you have to uh, lighten up on the concentration. See, and if you, oh, you're concentrating like this and all of a sudden you go, oh, lighten up after telling them, I didn't tell them yet, but that needs to be in this next class, the story of Soma that was working really hard like this. And then the Buddha comes and he says the story about the lute and the strings and not too tight, not too loose. And, and he goes like that. And I know if you have been stuck there a while and you've got your time up, but you're not seeing anything and you're working really hard, when you relax, and loosen, this is going to open. And all of a sudden you, wow, because now you have, oh boy, vision inside. And even the wider, the more relaxed you get, <gasps> peripheral vision inside. Can you imagine you have a screen, but now you're in circularama <laughs> inside and you can watch 
whatever is going on. And this has been shut down by the idea that has gone, uh, and we're very careful not, we're trying very hard not to talk about the breath. Um, you know, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're not doing that. We're trying to keep it completely out of it, but it's tough because if they've been practicing it before, you have to say, well, the thing is, the reason this got tight and it all got shut down was the uh, the false uh, understanding they got from the teachers. And I can't believe they were being taught wrong. I listened to a lot of Goenka talks and I didn't think he was doing a lot of things the wrong way. But I thought to myself over the years, a lot of things are being heard the wrong way. It's a big difference. So the teachers might be attempting to say it correctly, but there's no guarantee when you're teaching 5,000 people under a roof, one roof, that the people are going to hear what it is that you really want them to do. That's a big problem to face, a big challenge, not a problem. Okay, So I think that's what's really going on. And uh, we already uh, did come to discover one person that thought, I can't do this because if I do this, I won't be able to do breathing. It didn't he wasn't so far that he would say I can't breathe like the woman was in the two women were in Australia but he was at the point where I don't think that I can um, do this because it's so different and my point was trying to get him to understand that it's okay for you to learn to ride a bike and to rollerblade <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me kind of funny. And then when the, the class was over, they asked me, will you stay a minute? Because two people have asked to hear about the bicycle. And I said, okay, I'll tell them. You know, if I'm riding a bike and Perel is rollerblading and we're exercising and we're actually going 15, 20 miles on our journeys. I was rollerblading 30 miles, you know? And this was, you know, just for exercise on these wonderful paths in Washington. And suppose that I decided if I was rollerblading and you were on the bike, let's pretend that I would like you to teach me how to ride the bike, that I would, I'd like to bicycle and instead for a while. So can you teach me how to ride the bike? And you would say, let me show you the seat and the handlebars and the brakes and the gears. Let me show you the chain and the pedaling, how you do this when you change gears and the wheels. Let me show you that. And then, okay, let's go. It's time for you to get on the bike. And I come over to you with my rollerblades on and I say, okay, how do I get on? And you start smiling and you say, no, 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 you don't understand. You have to take the rollerblades off before you get on the bike and try to pedal. <laughs> okay. This is really, really important, but there's no reason why you can't learn to rollerblade and learn to ride a bike. There's no reason. And your riding the bike isn't going to hurt your rollerblading. And, and your rollerblading certainly didn't hurt your bike because you need all that, the strength in your legs from doing, I did a lot of uh, rollerblading before I did any long distance cycling. And then I had a lot of strength, you know? So it's complementing each other. We shouldn't get all upset about learning two things in life. And then I did point out um, to somebody in a discussion on the phone today that, you know, when you look at this another way, Dr. Ambikar, for instance, when you look at him, he didn't stop with one degree <laughs> at college. The man had like 12 or 15 degrees by the time he died. You know, he kept getting degrees and he kept learning every different subject. So it didn't hurt him to get a degree in philosophy, a master's or PhD in philosophy after a PhD in law and a PhD in medicine and a PhD in all this other stuff. It didn't hurt him. You see, so the problem here is how much accidentally, not on purpose, how much emphasis we come to believe in the object too, you know, because if you believe that object is so important, you have to listen to it. And if it pushes, I have to stop everything and listen to that because it's pushing. And I trained myself to hear that it's pushing and the no one's ever told the person. I, I've been through hundreds of students. No one's ever told the person they're in charge. There's so much about self and no self mixed up and we have to get rid of ourselves. Somewhere along the line, we, we lost the idea that this is our boat and we're steering it. And we are the ones that get to steer it through life. 
Nobody else is going to go up there and steer the boat through life. You see, we're the ones. So actually, we have all this power, but nobody told us it was okay for us to sit down and have a little discussion with our brain, <laughs> okay? And let our brain know, I've been training you uh, all these years to just work with breath. And whenever I sit down, obviously the mind and the body are connected. And if I sit immediately, my brain says that person's meditating on the breath, just like that, see? So now you have to say, well, I know I used to do that every time, <laughs> but now I would like to get a little, uh, try and see what uh, loving kindness is all about and step over and do that. Do you think that you could just kind of quiet down and let me just sit and do this? And I can certainly do that another time after I learn how to do this. You're not going to throw it away. You're not going to stop doing it. I spent a lot of time talking about that and they appreciated it too, that we're, this isn't going to damage anything. Think about it a minute. You are twin students. Tell me something, what you learned about the definitions of the terminology and the, about the hindrances management and about the truth of uh, how it, you can just uh, understand the nutriment and let go of the, per all those things are applicable to any other kind of meditation that you want to do. So if you didn't ever see those things, um, we're at a disadvantage this time because I'm not taking the time to tell them where I'm getting everything from. So uh, they have to trust me when I say normally in a retreat, you have heard me write things on the board and then put where everything is coming from. See? And, um, but these people, it's okay to start with. This is okay like this, but hopefully they'll start to ask questions. So the next one is, um, can you, can you move around and keep the practice of metta uh, going? And the answer is yes, you can. And you can keep it going all day long while you're working at, at school uh, or at work or anywhere. You, you can keep it going and putting it into everything. And of course, if you wanna do it, you just do it. This is the part that we thought about taking this out. We might put it in another day. You might be interested in this one. Uh, because this is like, if you drew on a piece of paper, you write down Metta Karuna Mudita Upeka. And then underneath it, you write loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And then underneath that, there's another line that goes, because uh, underneath it are the things that you give up by practicing that one. So underneath loving kindness would be the disappearance of thoughts of ill will, under compassion, the disappearance of thoughts of um, cruelty and under empathetic joy, the disappearance of thoughts of discontent. You can't be full of joy and discontent. <laughs> it is really funny. I was thinking about pieces of my life <laughs> and if I was really full of joy, could I be dis through discontent? And I saw the difference in, um, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, but I remember my first husband, he could. <laughs> you know, he could, he could flip out of being joyful and get really angry because something was making the, the, the goats go crazy in the barn and he'd just run out screaming, you know, and, like, and be really discontent. Whereas I think when I look back on that incident, I probably just would have walked over there to see what was going on maybe, but I would still be smiling. <laughs> you know, but this is the way, the way this affects us. Okay. So they also need to have uh, some other definitions like compassion. They need to have compassion. Uh, the thing about compassion, we've, we've talked to you before is compassion. Uh, let's see, compassion, empathy, and sympathy. These three words in modern times, they get very mixed up. In the hospitals, I would caution you, if you're working in hospitals, your nurses really go back and review this. Once in a while, they should have a quiz on it, you know, because if they're, if they're playing the empathy game, they're exhausted, absolutely exhausted. They go in a room with somebody who's really sick and they come out because they were feeling what the person was feeling. And if they're suffering from empathy, they need to find out and learn how to contradict this and, and straighten it out because sometimes when a person is em empathic, they don't understand what they're feeling is not theirs. You see, 
they are picking up and the person's feelings and then they are getting exhausted just like it was actually theirs and it isn't theirs and they have to go through a ward and work with so many people and if they're getting worn out and terrifying themselves at how exhausted they are this is something that needs to be looked at and it's a defined thing you have to just have them define it for themselves a few times and work with it and sometimes it helps them a whole lot so empathy is useless when the person is dying and you're going in there to take care of them it's, it's not helpful at all because you can't work and you're getting exhausted while you're doing your work and you can't help it if you're empathic so you have to figure out if a person has this going on how can we help them straighten them out with the definitions is the best way is that bonte and i found in florida when we were working in the hospitals with the nurses we would go and do luncheons and we would tell them over lunch about compassionate service and what they forgot from learning back in school that they just forgot about it because they did have it and i went through some training materials they did get it in nursing but it it doesn't come up as a big deal, you know, until something like COVID happens or something like that. You see, now we're stuck with this and it needs to be understood. So empathy is not, you're not gonna help the patient by being empathetic. Sympathy is a funny word. We have these card shops in the United States called Hallmark card shops. You probably have something like that around here. And you go in and all the cards are there for the different things you send cards for. And there's a big area for sympathy cards after someone died. And they're trying to get across to you a message. Sympathy is for after the person dies. <laughs> this is the message you were trying to get across, okay? So you don't send the family the sympathy card until the person dies. You know, you can send other kinds, get well soon, you know, I support, we would like to support your family, figure out a way, but not sympathy until after they're gone, okay? So we eliminate empathy because it exhausts you, sympathy because it's inappropriate. Now we have com compassion. And what happened to little compassion was it fell into this cup, <laughs> got locked in with one definition only. I, I just tell everybody, I, I, I went over and I just have so much compassion, so much compassion. And I wear myself out trying to have so much compassion. But the question is, what is compassion? And when we examine compassion, it's your wanting, your overwhelming desire to help someone somehow, okay? And the question is um, to do it so it's not damaging to you and exhausting you and wiping out your family when you do it. Okay, that's, that's number one to really watch out for. But then you have a stagnant or a static compassion versus an active compassion. And the active compassion is the one to develop because it's the most rewarding for you because you feel so good and energized by doing it. But when the person says, oh, I had a compassionate visit with Aunt Sue and they walked into the room, she's in the bed in the hospital and they, she said, what did you do? Oh, well, I, I, I folded her blanket. I put it at the bottom of the bed and fixed the curtain and moved to the chair. Okay, <laughs> then I left. Okay, but she wasn't, you didn't, you have the ability to go in uplifted about this and you were sad when you went in. If you're looking at, everything's going to work out when you walk in and you're uplifted, then you, they come up to where you are. You lift the patient because where you are, that's where they come up to. It's not supposed to be that you fall down to where the patient is. That's the danger point for the nurse and compassionate service worker. As soon as they start falling into that trap, they're really totally worn out quickly and exhausted. So this is the story of compassionate service is figuring out how you can serve. And I have a friend who runs all of the, all of the, the classes on the Google system is one of the most compassionate people I've ever met in my life to do those, those classrooms and manage that whole thing over and over and over again all through the day to, to help so many people and handle people's questions on a consistent basis, but she's very good with her time. You know, she's very good. This is where I can do this for you. <laughs> and then that's it. And then I'm home and everybody leave me alone. And then I go and work really hard again. She's very good at her time. 
and she's very uh, good with that. That makes it good for her. And that makes it the most rewarding thing for you. Okay, so when you go look at compassion, if we gave you a definition of it, we worked very hard to come up with this. Number one, I see a person in pain. Number two, I understand that person's pain is their pain. That's the second part of the definition. Number three, um, I, um, let's see, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a compassion. I see the person in pain. I know it's their pain and I can't take it away. I, um, I look at what I, the person, okay, I try, I know that the, the thing I can do for the person is uh, make sure that they have the space to have their pain. That's the what this is all about. When we take a person to the hospital because we can't handle it here, we're hoping that the person will be in a location where they get what they need, but in a location where they can have their pain without criticism and over care and sobbing and all things around them from the family and everything. That's what we're looking for, for the support person to be able to have that. So it's seeing the person in pain, understanding it's their pain and you can't take it away, putting them, helping them to be in a position, whether they need a place to lie down, a place to keep warm, have enough water beside the bed, it, whatever it is, okay? And besides the general care, and then you take care of that and you do it without wiping yourself out. That is the key to this whole thing. And um, you have to have an impersonal approach. If you have too personal approach, you get trapped in thinking I should have saved that person. And it can really hurt. I should have saved that person. I should have, and then I blame myself. So these are the things that when we talked to them and we took it apart, when they went back to work, their productivity went like that and went up. There's first smiling more, they understood, they had reviewed, if I'm up, the patient comes up and gets uplifted. They looked at compassion and figured out empathy, sympathy, and compassion, and then they were clear. And those women, when they went back, they were working much stronger and much more productive, but much clearer and happier and feeling better about nursing. I think it's really important. You know, if nursing only turns out to be total, complete, utter exhaustion to the point where some are either, you know, are even dying and such because of the exhaustion, then that's really sad that it's happening. And we can ease that pain by clearing up the definitions. Okay, the next one is um, the difference, what we should look at the difference between real equanimity and indifference because we have these three kinds of feelings you know and the feeling is um you know the feeling is um tell me the feeling <laughs> somebody tell me the two feelings <laughs> Bonte, tell me the two feelings <laughs> i'm going positive and negative in here i think i'm tired or something but um what is it pleasant and unpleasant feeling Pleasant and unpleasant, and we have one called neutral. neutral. And the neutral one uh, is not is a nickname for the original the, the original translation. The pleasant and unpleasant is pretty clear, okay? Just a pleasant or unpleasant feeling. But they threw in neutral as a modern day translation, but it's not really true. It's neither pleasant nor painful. It's so then it falls more clearer into it's indifferent. So indifference, but you have to know how you handle these feelings, okay? And so the pleasant feeling, we understand what that is and we know what to do. We, the unpleasant feeling, we understand what to do with that, these two sides of letting go. But the tough one is neither pleasant nor painful feeling. The problem is you fall into indifference and there is no mindfulness. The mindfulness turns off. And then you're in a glut, you know, you're in a mud, in the mud. It's like you were driving and monsoon was here and we're in Mumbai <laughs> and all of a sudden there it goes. You're going into the mud and you, you can't do anything with that. You can't do it. So you have to just understand to watch out for it and let it go. Relax, smile, come back. Just never mind it. And then let go, relax, smile and come back. 
as far as going down the path to Nibbana, uh, what is the culmination point of the metta for the Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka? I think we're probably going to tell them about that tomorrow night. We're not going to do it tonight. We're not talking to them so much about Nibbana like we would be in a retreat. And the reason for this is because if you look at the broad scheme of things, who comes to practice meditation? Wow. <laughs> you know, you, you have a very broad base of people come for their health, to let go of anxiety, to have rest after work. It goes on and on all these reasons. A lot of people are not coming to go to Nibbana, but what we have to show them is something that can really help them. And because it works, they may get more interested to go as far as they can in this life and go to Sotapanna. They could do that very well, you see? Sotapanna suffers a lot because the definitions for Sotapanna have been extenuated and, and made extremified. How's that for a word? Extremified and changed away from what a Sotapanna actually is. So that's where the monk was legitimate in Sri Lanka who told me, why would we practice meditation? Or the man told me, our monk told us, why should you practice meditation in this lifetime? Because you couldn't become a Sotapanna for 10,000 years. <laughs> and they're like, whoa, who told you that? <laughs> it was like, then I had to, he, his whole family could speak English. And I said, um, I said to him, uh, you know, you told me that, do you know about Sati, about Satipatthana Sutta? He said, yes, we know about that. And I said, did you ever go to Satipatthana retreat? He said, I did when I was younger, I did. I said, did, you, did they read the last page of the Satipatthana Sutta to you? He said, what do you mean? And I made him go to the last page of the Satipatthana Sutta, the part that says it could be as long as seven years or as little as seven days for you to reach Nibbana. <laughs> and I'm there like, you really, they gave him a kind of a, a ride there. <laughs> and it's, I don't think it was the monk's fault at all because the situation with the monks today are they're doing what their teachers did and the teachers were doing what their teacher's teacher did. And it goes back, we're not how, sure how far, but this is a, it, it comes from, this must be a legitimate way for us to handle this whole thing with this religion. Why? Because in the Hindu system, that is the way they preserve everything, you see? And everything has stayed the same for basically, I don't know how many thousands of years now. In the time of the Buddha, it was 7,000 years. I can say that. So it's 2,500, that's 9,500 years. They've been teaching the young people, uh, the Upanishads and the Vedas, the exact same way for 9,500 years or something. So if, if we're living over here and they grew up around all of this and that system was still active too, uh, then they look at being monks here and they go into Buddhism. Well, why wouldn't they think that it's perfectly all right to keep doing it this way? And that's how it got stuck. It just from the influence, the cultural influence around it in Asia. So we're back to that. And the Buddha was defiant. I mean, he was, ooh, he was an activist and he was defiant. He really changed the, uh, the student teacher relationship. And that was phenomenal. When we go back and look at Dandapani, when we go back to look at the Niganta Niputta, <laughs> when we look at uh, all these things and he was defying, there, this relationship of I tell you and you accept it and don't worry about testing anything, you know? And he comes in and he says to his own monks, I don't, a couple of suttas in there, he says, I don't even want you to believe what I say. And I can see them all sitting there going, huh, what do you say now? <laughs> you know, they're all, uh, what was that? <laughs> no, he doesn't even want you to believe him and he's the Buddha. He wants you to know something only by seeing it. He wants you to test it to see if it makes you happy and feel better and lighter. He wants you to share it with people to see if they can do the same thing to lighten up their life. This was a really good thing that was thoroughly and it was completely uh, based on based on the idea of helping people. It was a humanistic approach. It was not uh, just to have another group opinion. 
It was a humanistic investigation. And there were, I said that to them, you should have seen some of their faces when I said, who do you think the Buddha was actually teaching? Do you think he was teaching Buddhists? <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't teaching Buddhists. When you read it, if you read it again and again and again, you begin to get the total clarity of he was not doing that. This was a human, uh, an experiment for human beings to see what would happen if they stayed over here in the wholesome instead of the unwholesome, kept the precepts instead of breaking the precepts, were taking things impersonally instead of personally. And look at that, just from the aspect, I wondered, for instance, I wondered one time, uh, how did he get the title among all the titles he had? How did he get the title of the master peacemaker? Where'd it come from? And if you, you attack that for an investigation and try to look up all the different places that uh, the Buddha went, you know, went in there, he was in the town when it was going on or something, or he went to a particular king and straightened it out and stopped the whole armies from fighting each other. And then he, uh, he saved a village and he did so many things like that. How? And I'll tell you how. He taught them Brahma Vihara's practice then he showed them how to use the Four Noble Truths as a reconciliation, peace reconciliation type of thing, okay? And with the Four Noble Truths alone, if you take the four steps of the Noble Truths, is there is suffering, there is cause, there is cessation, there is a way to the cessation. Now we have a big problem in this group and we need to talk about it. So everybody get a piece of paper and everybody please sit down and tell them right on this one side of the sheet, I used to do it this way, you know, um, right on one side of the sheet, I want you to write, okay, you take a piece of paper like this, you fold it in half like this, okay, and then you give everybody this first page. What do you consider the most challenging thing in your department where everything's falling apart? <laughs> What do you think it is? There's 10 people working in there, okay? Next page, you open it up and on, then you fold it back like this. The next page is, what do you personally think the cause of all of this was? What do you think the cause of it is? And then the third page is, what do you think the cessation of this problem would look like? What do you personally want it to look like in your department? You can do this with department's heads. You can lock them all up in a big company or a hospital or big clinic or a publishing house. And they've never done that before. <laughs> they've been running their own departments and there's a system of doing this where you make them turn around and look at this for real, if there's something failing. And so then you take the next page and you say, what do you think the solution is? And then the last page, you kind of leave the last page open because you're all gonna work on it together. And the, whoever is the coordinating thing would be Dr. Parat. We give him all our pain and give it all to him for the board of directors or something. And we say, okay, um, can you look at these pages from all 20 people or so many people? And can you suggest a solution we could all try? That would encompass, fulfill the guidance plan for the Eightfold Path. They have to keep the entire eightfold path intact as they attempt to make the solution come to real. And the master, the king, which I consider Dr. Barat a great leader for our board, you know, the king person would always be able to present that page, the solution suggestion beside the eightfold path, and they would be able to the people who were involved would be able to see their piece in there somewhere. When he writes out that solution for everybody to try, that's what we used to do in the music group I was in. I only had six people. I did that years ago and they loved it. They got an input for everything, everything I did when I was a professional um, in music, okay? The people who were playing the instruments and involved in the show itself, they got to say which numbers worked, what kind of music they wanted to play, just everything. And then we put it together and everybody loved the whole thing. And it was so wonderful, just wonderful. But this works in companies, this works inside clinics where people are in disagreement, in small hospitals where we're wondering why you know, the person is the director or what, you know, and then this 
person, this big surgeon has got so many more degrees. Why isn't he in charge? Or they're trying to iron out things. And one of the things that happens when you take an organization and you do this, you're, you're playing, you're applying Buddhism, the Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist uh, approach to this by using the Four Noble Truths. But one thing that's neat is when they do this on a weekend retreat and they do one page each day, together they each take a turn as department heads talking to you about who they are we call it the big brag day as the first day everybody has to take an individual turn who are you what is your resume what are your strong points where did you work before what did you do what were, you, what were your awards we want you to brag for one day <laughs> we want you to brag the next day uh the question is um what is your job in the company? You see, what is your particular job in the company? And what do you do as the director of X? And what is your job title? Then what are your, is your job description? And you know what? These three guys over here, they never heard the fourth guy talk about who he really was. So they don't even know that in the uh, CEO and the CFO and the material, the ha handling department, what they even do down there or a production. The production guy never talks to material handling or the upper people. But once we find out who everybody is, and then you put those four people back, they're not allowed to discuss anything they discussed for the weekend. You put them back into the pot and let them work together. Watch what happens. Now you're going to go to Perel because you heard that before she knew something about something and she's going to go over here to Alex because Alex was before he was involved in that. And then Alex is going to talk to Sarah and everybody's talking. And then you're conferring with each other and you never did that before. You were competing as upper level management or middle level management or lower middle management amongst yourselves. That's how you make the big corporations actually work. I did a couple of those in Washington. It was really fun, but my mind was much sharper. I don't know if I could do that. But you know, the facilitator doesn't do anything except say, Perel, what's your name? You know, what else? What else? What else? What else? That's all you say all weekend. What else? What else? What else? So I don't have to, mm, I don't have to think of any stories or anything else. What else? What else? And then it's your turn, Barat, you know, and he's doing it. And what else? What else? What else? We're trying to show that you still are in touch with what you love. You might not be working in what you exactly particularly love, but you're still in touch with what you love. We want to know what you love so we can tap you from material handling and production and the other sections of the company. And the CFO starts working with the CEO and nobody's competing anymore. And all of a sudden the profits go through the roof. It's wonderful. <laughs> I wish I could have kept doing that. It was really fun. But so I need your questions now. You can talk to me. This is what we're working on. You know what we're doing. And I'd like to get some feedback from you. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, I must appreciate what you're doing because uh, you know this is uh, something which will have a wider application in the sense that uh, right now, when we talk about a 10 day physical retreat, it's quite demanding and not everybody can uh, uh, get uh, 10 days off from their life, uh, especially women, uh, especially who are uh, in need and who are working. Uh, uh, for them, it's a little difficult to uh, take 10 days off and come for uh, attending a, a full-time 10-day retreat. So here you are developing a curriculum which can uh, even touch lives of uh, more people in a, in a different uh, way uh, while not compromising on the principles of the teaching or principles of what Buddha said. So I think this is really uh, remarkable. So it's like a parallel uh, stream where uh, uh, a wider uh, audience could be trained to understand what Buddha wanted to say and to uh, spread the message of uh, Buddha and this, you know, teaching uh, uh, how to take metta into life is really important uh, for uh, the general society. So I think this is uh, something uh, which we can uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, at the end of your five days, make a real uh, structure so that it becomes kind of fixed 
And, well, uh, I'll tell you something. I'm working with a copywriter who's helping me with the book's development. And the one book we have, uh, we're working on making it really cool. We want to make it. So actually, I wanted to make it a book this size, you see? And we were saying, well, how many pages can we handle if we have a book this size? Well, this is a thesaurus. And if you have this kind of paper, uh, this book is actually 679 pages. <laughs> Okay, so I said that I don't think there's a problem, you know. So, um, so we want to have small books like this that are really fun that are um, color coded, you know, color coded. If you have a five day retreat, you have the one for each day. So I told her what we're doing. I called her on the phone. I said this first day it worked really well, and I said, you know, I'm I'm shooting her through the tunnel. I'm shooting her old articles. I said, no, no, let's let's leave the old articles alone for a while. Let's just leave them alone and fin work just these two books. We have two books in the pot. We have the big index project. We have the Nevermind game that are in the pot. Those are the two that are in the pot, okay? Let's go in this direction. She and the artist have already talked about, be really fun to have small books that are like this size, half paper size, okay? Or the size I just showed you, which is one fourth, that you can put them in your pocket, take them with you and spread them all around and leave them all around. And we take this model that we're building now and I'm sending it to her each day. And then we discuss it afterwards to refine it and I'd like to repeat it at the university, which I'm sure she'll let us do now because they're, they're really happy with it so far. And so I'm sure we, out of all those students, we had like the 175, we got 88 of them in this time. Maybe we can get the others to come in a second round and do it again yeah. and yeah. test it. And ultimately, if, uh, uh, out of uh, 100 people, even if uh, five or 10 are stimulated to join the longer course, then it I... kind of, you know, uh, uh, it's <laughs> like having a, Yeah. A, a, oh, they'll a, come. A, That's absolutely yes. what will happen. That is absolutely yes. if they do this way. But I want you to see, I want you to understand one thing to always tell people and help to get this word around. With this practice, the way for true development is not in the time of the retreat. The, the imprinted thing in modern times is go to the retreat. I, I realized the damage of this when I met a man in Malaysia who goes to the, he has a great marriage because he goes to a retreat four times a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he told me. I have a great marriage. I go four times a year for one month. <laughs> That's like four months. You know, I said, of course you have a great one. I mean, I have relatives who used to go to China and clipper ships and they'd go home and get the wife pregnant and leave for 17 months and come back and say hello to the new baby, get her pregnant again and go back to China. They had a marvelous time. All four of those brothers, they didn't have any problem with their marriages and they gave birth. I think she gave birth. But they gave birth, you know, together to eight children. This was in the 17, 1800s, 1820s, you know. <laughs> So my, my point is we can take these one day at a time. And I, I was laughing with her because I said, you know, this is just progressive. This is coming at the right time. It's progressive. It's a new idea, but the damage system, we have to, you know, fix the damage system because everybody thinks the only time you develop your meditation is when you're at retreat. And this meditation yes, yes, yes. is for all the time. You're supposed to be smiling to all the nurses and giving them one flower, at least in each ward. And you're supposed to be <laughs> counseling people and, you know, keeping smiling no matter what they tell you, <laughs> you know, and, but you're, you're supposed to be using it. And that's why the nevermind game has to happen because the nevermind game is so much fun. <laughs> you know, I even told them if they have trouble with the bunch of R's, they just say, Never mind. Let go. Relax. Smile. Come back and smile some more. You see how easy that is? Never mind. Whatever it is. Never mind. Just never mind. I keep telling. So what you is the? My question was, uh, what is the uh, time commitment for each of the participant? You have said that you had a one and a half hours. Uh, Google yeah, Meet. Well, so besides that, uh, yeah. at home, uh, how much uh, are they supposed to put in? They're only sitting twice a day, but that doesn't mean they're only practicing those two sittings, does it? 
But if you're talking breathing meditation, it means when you're doing two sessions, that's when you're practicing your breathing meditation. But when you're talking in terms of this meditation, your whole staff should be walking around the hospital with this all the time. You know, and every time something is full of anxiety, like the bucket just fell over and all the poop is on the floor. Okay, fine. You know why it's fine? Because I just told you what a Nietzsche is and it has a beginning, a middle and an end. So if there isn't anybody from the maid service to clean it up, just clean it up and wash your hands and go on. Don't be upset with everything. You know, the whole thing, everything that's in existence is arising and passing away, arising and passing away, rising and passing away. So it's like when they, he said it to me, get with the program. You're not going to collapse and go insane. I said, oh, I don't know. He said, no, just keep doing this and you'll be fine. I really don't, uh, I agree with him. You can get through anything with Bhante, you know, telling me that all those years, you know, and sometimes it was really hard, <laughs> you know, but it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what's happening. It's amusing. Just keep in mind it's amusing. Like I said in what I was describing to you, can you go in for one day and impersonally look at everything that's going on no matter what it is? And no matter what gets in your face or how frustrated you are, can you forgive it and give a little space with compassion and keep smiling through it? That's all. It doesn't have to be a big smile. I had some people in the class like, and I'm there, don't show your teeth. Don't show your teeth. Just smile. It's these muscles. They're already saying, but why do I have to smile? I said, don't ask me that question. He said, why? I said, because when I went to my teacher and I said, I don't feel like smiling. What do you say? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. It, it's like you're saying, but I don't want to put gas in the car. Well, then you can't go anywhere. You see, but I don't want to pump the gas. Well, there's nobody here to pump it. Get out and pump the gas and let's go. <laughs> That's that simple. You see, we have to reduce this out and start having, look, you, there's not a, not a lot of stuff, Bharat, that you can have fun with right now, but you can have fun with me. <laughs> you can have fun doing this, you know, because you just have to laugh at the whole, the whole situation. That's all there is to it. Uh, you guys were talking about going to see land the first part of uh, June. Did you know now that you can't go until June 16th? Did you know that? That was just declared yesterday, last night. Can't go yes. anywhere until June 16th now. They're all telling oh, me about that. <laughs> no, it's, it's not official yet. Oh, well, it's official in Pune. Everybody in Pune knows they can't go anywhere until June 16th. That's what the business people were telling me I was talking to the other day and I'm there. Okay. Well, it's, um, I don't know. Maybe they'll come back on it. It would be nice to see if people would come down instead of coming up like that. Yeah. But, oh my gosh. <laughs> so it's, um, what is that thing about life is, a, oh no, I can't remember. What is that saying? I can't remember what that is. I do. Did I send you your frustration cartoon this week? Did I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you show that? Did you show the children that? You should have your. You should be able to show the kids that on the phone. Isn't it priceless? This is um, Frank. You, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, what this is. I may have sent it to you and Sarah. Did I send it to you and Sarah? The lemur and the eagle? Did I? And no, we haven't seen that one. You haven't? Oh, it's priceless. No. I'll, I'll send it to you. It's just okay, great. great. Oh, it's funny. You know, it just makes you think your life is really simple <laughs> when you see the lemur, you know, and um, it's just, it's very nice humor. It's the kind of humor that I really like to see. So. So anyway, that's what we're doing. And um, the effort is to try to make sure, I think everything you said was really important. You know, um, attend, they'll come to 10 day retreats if they get results from this. And I wanna tell you something, this is only the first, this was the first class today. 
And two of them were, this is what happened. If you're taught, you know, you'll understand you. Okay. So this is like the first day. And uh, the guy came, one guy came and then a second guy showed up with the same problem. And it's their issue is whenever they sit in loving kindness, something happens and they begin to feel very, very, very light. And they don't know what that is. And they think they should stop right immediately as if it's a hindrance, you see. Now what this is, it's not that they're overly paying attention to it. It's that they're shocked. They've never felt this release and this lightness before. They've never done anything where they were told to relax and smile. And the relax and smile is reducing the tension very fast in them. This is what we've seen before with these uh, students from Goenka before. They're very close to, if you can get them to do this, they'll, they'll, go, they'll go from first, second, third, fourth jhana, boom, 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 like that. They'll go right in to moving up to the people, to the directions, just like that. How come? How come? Um, because one of the missing missed pieces of misinformation that was there or interpreted the wrong way was that anything that happens, any feeling that occurs at all in your body is a distraction. Anything that makes you move to, toward it is a distraction. So everything, everything should be six R's. But when you take one of these students who never heard of the reduction of tension and tightness out gradually down like this, like I show you on the diagram, it's going out Freddie's head like this. Every time he lets go and he relaxes and comes back, it's here. Next time he lets go and relaxes, it comes here. See, I'm going down. As I go down, I am zeroing out my tension and tightness in my body. They're proving all of this in research. And when, and then when the, um, you get to the point of cessation, you're pushing zero tension and tightness. To fall into a cessation is to fall into a zero zone. So you're a doctor. Why, if I can, a child and I come to you and I say, Doctor, please explain to me, why do I feel my body? If a seven or eight-year-old came to you and said, how do I feel my body? What would you explain to him, Bharat? Uh, it's, uh, it's our mind that, that has the uh, uh, control of the body and is able to feel the sensations. So there are nerves which run from the body to the mind, to the brain, and that uh, gives rise to the feeling of the body. Okay, but the reason I feel the, um, the um, losing touch with my body, what's happening to me is the, is the total relaxation and the research for meditation, they hook up the skin. And uh, they were explaining to me when I was working in research in Sri Lanka, the doctor was explaining to me how they do that. When they hook up your skin and everything, they can, when the tightness, the tightness goes out, you know, what your cohesion is your skin sac and how much water is in the body? How much water is in there? The body. 70%, 70%. So, so what is it that tightens the sac? So I feel my body, tension and tightness sort of tension developed from mus muscular structure and everything in the body and all that. There's a muscle, see? So if I'm letting go and relaxing my concern, the more I relax, then everything in the body can heal faster. They already know that. They want to put them in stasis to send them to Mars so they completely relax. I told them they should just get them to practice. <laughs> but, you know, the point is, the reason you feel your body is this cohesion, which is the one of the, the one that has to do with the water and everything in your body when he's explaining the water element, the cohesion is the muscular structure that runs through your body that holds this all together. And what happens to you when you let go and 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 let go and, go and, go and you're and you're just and that's how the person can really learn to relax if you learn to do that and you know what it feels like to go to the lower levels of tension and tightness. Pretty soon you can sit in a chair as a doctor in your, in your office with the door closed for 10 minutes and get two hours of sleep. That's how come. And when they measure it out and they say 10, 12 minutes, two hours of sleep, how'd that happen? 
because you knew how to drop into the zero zone and release every bit of tension in your entire body. And that's what a power sit is. That's what I used to teach the executives to do in Washington in some of the companies was to, to uh, encourage them to just let go of everything, absolutely everything, and sit very quietly. And then the more you can do that and drop, drop, drop everything out. The whole thing is about letting go, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and the personal concern, I might, but shouldn't do that. I might just sort of flush myself away, <laughs> you know, but no, you've got skin around you, <laughs> okay? So what happens is you can just, as light as a feather, as light as possible. So now what they're trying to do, uh, they have all kinds of development and all of this. And with the research, there's a bunch of people who are digitally inclined. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> and they wanna bring it all to the point of decibels and the wavelengths and vibrations and have you put this on and be able to get to that point just like that. I don't buy it. Bhante doesn't totally buy it either because we still believe there's a lot of information that you need to have and understand that the Buddhist point was that it was a parallel training system of Dhamma comprehension and practice of doing in, in like this, just running just like that. And that when you reach Nirvana, you not only are ready to fall into cessation to come out and experience in the Nirvana, you are also primed with nothing's going to come up you don't understand by the time you get there. You're going to understand how uh, the relationships of everything that kept you from being able to be there before. And I think that eliminating the comprehension is a game, but yeah, it's a, there's a lot of games with this stuff that goes on. A lot of people who really don't aren't serious at all. They just want to feel or not feel and they're doing it for that reason but so you can put a person in that position but how much what does it do for you is a question that's the thing but that's what we talk about relaxing yeah i've got a couple of questions if you've got time to sure i'm here <laughs> okay um first of all what was that you just shared with us your, your second session what was yeah. the first session you did? what was the what the first session well, the reason I did that was because I need a rehearsal and I need to, when I get off here, I have to write the rest of it before I go to sleep. <laughs> I needed to see, I, I, I told, he said, you, don't you remember you had the 6.30 thing? I said, yeah. And he said, what am I supposed to do? And we said, I'm supposed to do the Sigil Levada and I've got it, but I could do, could have done it really halfway cooked for you, but I decided that's not cool. I want to take the time to type it out because I never, I never typed out that sutta, so I want to type out the framework for you to have it. It's, okay. um, yeah, and so, so I- So you went to the, the Sikha Vada Sutta with them, the, the, uh, uh, the training for lay people. Yeah, but I'm not going to teach them that. I'm not going to do that to these people. I'm talking about well, what, you guys. What, what did you do for them in the, in the first session? In the first session here, I can tell you. I can tell you. Okay, so I set up, uh, the document is set up in a way where I bring you uh, the objective. Can you uh, share the screen? The, the, send it over to you guys to look at? Oh, no. Uh, oh, the, this one? Share. Yeah, okay. I can do that. Wait, let's see. I can do that. I can whip you through it, I think. if I Well, I have to go, don't I? Mm, okay. I'll be right back. Just a second. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to go to here. And then I want to go to, it's always fun to figure out if I know where to go. I want to go to um, here and then to here and then to Mumbai University and then to the first day, right? Okay, now I go back to you guys. <clears throat> I don't know how to get back to you. This happens sometimes. Wait a minute, maybe I can share. Okay, now if I go back down into share, oops, where'd I go? Um, wait a minute. 
don't, I don't know where I'm going here. No, I don't need you. I don't need that. I have these people. I don't want to leave the meeting. No. <laughs> okay, now share screen. It should be back up there. Let's see if I got it. Um, hmm. This one? Day one. Okay, day one. All right, so see what we were doing, we're trying to keep track of what the starting system was for this and we did it. So initially we had 175 students come and listen and then we, we, uh, uh, we actually booked uh, 88 of them for the, for the uh, thing the next, uh, within the next 24 hours. So that was hearing the aim of the workshop and why it was requested and listening to the meta instructions in the beginning and uh, they listened to, uh, they had 10 minute instructions, short instructions, and they ha we had to do it in two languages. So it was taking a long time. And that cut into our time, but we, we, we're we fine. I'm, I'm good at doing that kind of stuff. If we get short, we can make something happen. So um, <clears throat> the um, right now we have 85 to 90 people going through the retreat. Okay, so this was done and I tried to do it in uh, points. So the objective of the meditation was uh, for living day to day uh, that the Buddha taught for the benefit of um, living the wholesome instead of the unwholesome mind states. And this is how he starts out in the very beginning of his teaching and wholesome mind states uh, have thoughts of non ill will, non cruelty. And we're trying to weave together get them to really understand what the Brahma Viharas are, you know, so we're trying to show them it starts with him teaching wholesome uh, instead of unwholesome direction. And then we had to bring in the precepts also, but I'll show you what we did. So learning the practice of the Brahma Viharas, beginning with metta, the Buddha reveals there's four gifts for each of us, like four flowers, the seeds for four flowers that have never been fully cultivated inside of us. So the only time I read part of a sutta was when I went to the Buddhist uh, son Rahula in Rahula Wada Sutta, four verses for them to understand that this um, teaching was recommended by the Buddha to his son before he left the group of monks to go and teach in another area of the country. Okay, uh, and so that's the value of the metta, the karuna, mudita, and upeka is the um, the person cannot be having thoughts of ill will or cruelty or um, discontent or um, the, um, the last one, right? <laughs> aversion. Aversion disappears. And that those are the core structure for all of the hindrances that bother you, all of the distractions that ever happen to you. So when you're practicing this way, um, we're showing you that you're beginning to purify and retrain your brain. You're sharpening your awareness and perfecting your mindfulness, which is your investigation. And this allows you to watch how life is actually operating. Because a lot of us people that asked for this were having a lot of trouble. We've already had requests. Uh, I know there's requests because of, um, that she's probably gonna let me do the death and dying, um, the death and dying workshop, the dying with uh, grace and, um, what is dying with grace and dignity that I put together in Malaysia. She's probably going to let me do that for them. And then there's lots of requests like that. So you start with this and then you can get them to go further into the other part. <clears throat> so we didn't read the precepts to them because we, we just put, they were given this page, you know, and we knew they knew Panchasila. But the point is that these these uh, these precepts are really important. Uh, they're they're set up to prevent the arising of any distracting hindrances while you're practicing your meditation. They're also serving as an umbrella uh, that stops the hindrances from distracting you or attacking you in life and in meditation. And so keeping these makes a lot of sense. And one of the tragedies in, that's happened in Buddhism is that. In truth, they never have been called training precepts. We can't find it anywhere in the text. I've consulted many Pali scholars and it's not there. And yet we hear teachers saying, these are just training precepts for your retreat. But that's not what they are. They were meant to be kept all the time in life so that your mind uh, can start to uh, stay clear. And whenever you break a precept, we wound the heart and the mind. And this causes a distraction to come up later in your meditation or in your life and bother you and it, it builds up and pressure 
And this is a direct cause and effect, this relationship between the precepts and these hindrances. So you look at the hindrances, once again, we didn't read these to them because they already know them. We, but, so we told them the best way to overcome the hindrances was when they come up is to tell the mind to recognize the imperfection, relief it, release it, okay? And then relax your head and mind, re-smile and return to send the metta again and keep it going with a smile. Now, with the, when the precepts are broken, if we don't retake them, this is seeing cause and effect in action and breaking the precept is the cause and the hindrance arising is the effect. So this stops our progress in the meditation. It also causes problems in life. And then 2.4 is that you support yourself by forgiving yourself and give and gently take the precepts again to yourself wherever you are. And there, I also pointed out to them that Bonte and I uh, are unneeded to give you precepts. They're not our precepts. We're not giving them to you. Um, you're supposed to be taking them there. They belong to you and they're your property. You do what you want with them. It's nice to come to the temple and do it all together and have the monk there to do the service with you, but that's not really what they're for, okay? You're being taught to remind it at the temple to keep them all the time at home and say them yourself each day. And when you break one, you say it, and then you immediately uh, forgive yourself and, and say them again and and then you go back into life. So the five precepts are here is lust and greed, hatred, aversion, sloth and torpor, uh, explaining what each one is and the restlessness, guilt and remorse and the doubt. Then the next one is a very important part of working with the hindrances is during the meditation is to understand that they are an imperfection and they need to be abandoned. There's never, we're never supposed to set a war up with these things. We, we're, we're gonna talk about that all through this workshop. They do have a kind of food that keeps them coming back for more and the nutriment is called your personal attention. So whenever we engage a hindrance, <coughs> <coughs> whenever we indulge in it, uh, that personal attention causes it to get bigger and stronger and stay around longer. And as soon as we notice uh, our attention is moving to them, we always should release them, relax, smile and come back to our present time meditation or task in life. Now, the third point is not to change your instructions at all when you practice. Don't add or subtract the ingredients for the recipe. And the Buddhists left us and apply our definitions and terminology when you practice. You should ask questions consist persistently. <laughs> and they're beginning to. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I asked for it. <laughs> and you should ask questions if you hear something different and you want to know why. Just ask us. So the, the words, I won't go into these, but the words we wanted them to understand because they never heard them defined really is meditation, mindfulness, delusion, craving, purifying the mind and retraining the mind. And always when practicing, you are helping your present time interaction work better in life. And these definitions fit together in a way that help you progress the most in your meditation. While sitting, you always be sure that all the steps when you practice, letting go of distractions. And most important is to keep smiling all the time that you are practicing and during your day, remember to always do all the steps when a distraction comes up to bother you during your task in life. So then we put the instructions again, okay? And then here, the bottom last part of the lesson was uh, now you've got to hear, hear, uh, here is how to keep track of your own meditation progressing. You get a small notebook and you guys know this from your retreats. We told them, um, we told them to, um, to write down the five, uh, the five questions on each page and you answer the five questions, um, which is the uh, current object of meditation, longest sitting time, how long were you on the object before you were pulled away? And when it was pulled away, what did you do? Those four are the most important because the object of meditation keeps changing. You have to put that every time you do the report. Did you, um, did anything new happen about in, during the meditation, write it down and 
Was there any question about something that happened in the meditation? Write it down and ask the question at the next sitting and that's the end of it. So see, there wasn't a lot. We had to get this to uh, basically four sections and that, and that was what I guessed. And I was, uh, it came out one hour and five minutes and we had one hour, was, our aim was one hour. We came out one hour, five minutes, which is remarkable the first time. I don't like that, you good girl, good girl. <laughs> You know, because it's, you know, we had to not go off track at all. He had to translate sentence by sentence by sentence with me. I only pulled him into the hole a couple times because I said a few sentences, but only twice, I think. I promised him I won't do it again tomorrow. I said, this is the whole thing. We need practice. We, you know, in, in Indonesia, we had lots of practice. And when you listen to Brenda to translate for me or Bonte, boy, we're right in rhythm, you know? just right in rhythm and it just goes on smoothly. But here it's a big struggle because uh, uh, when she was translating the instructions, for instance, I was, I couldn't say anything, but I asked Mega the next day, I said, she wasn't just translating what I said, she was putting her own stuff in it, you see? So there was impossible for me to plan the time for that. We had the translation on the page in front of me and I know even though it's Marathi, <laughs> I know it wasn't that long when it was that long on the page, you know? And so there was a lot of trying to just help make it work and make sure they had all the instructions. But I, everybody knew what they were doing by the end of the night. And now that we opened the, the, opened the, um, the question space open, <laughs> now we're in for it, you know, I'm going to get excited anyway. I just have to put a sign up when I'm going to answer questions. That's the way I figure it. Otherwise, I'll never go to sleep. I'll just keep going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's really great, uh, and I like the structure of that. Could you share a copy of that through the WhatsApp group? Or I'm not going to put it out on the WhatsApp. We put it up to the copywriter, but uh, I can put uh, We will share this with the recording of the, uh, this thing. Uh, with the recording of uh, uh, today's talk, I will share the document. Oh, good. Okay. okay. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Today's document by tomorrow will. Auntie, uh, come back. The video. <laughs> and oh, then uh, I keep a link over there so you can download the document. I can share <laughs> it now also. <laughs> Bonte, you sounded magnificent. You sounded like 104 years old. Yeah, I can you hear me? Yes, but you, <laughs> you were saying, I can support the <laughs> document for you. I'll send it over to you now. And then you said, I'll send it now. <laughs> the internet is kind of bad. Uh, oh, dear. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you know, the dog will never forgive me if I start imitating. The, I can also send it now. So I have sent it. So you hey. can download it now or a day later. <laughs> okay. So you guys can get a copy of that. Okay, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, yeah. You mentioned in the, uh, just briefly about the sutta, which talks about um, you can go the whole way on this path in seven years or seven days. Yeah. And I wonder what the importance is about the the seven days, and also, actually, yeah, that, I'll leave it there. That's my well, first. The, the, the seven days is one week, okay? So yeah, the way the way the thing is set up. Did you ever listen to it before? Did you ever listen to it? I probably have, but I can't bring yeah. it to mind now. So, so when when that yeah, happened yeah, to me, with, when that happened to me with that man, I said, "Well, tell you what, I'm not going to tell you what." You, I said, can you read? He said, I can read as well as I can speak. And he has really good English. So what I did was I asked him to read the last couple paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And he sat there in the room and read it to, to me and to the family. He said, I've never heard it before. Been to lots of Satipatthana things, but no one ever reads this. And you bet they don't. <laughs> you know, uh, I can understand why they wouldn't bother reading it unless they were being serious about reading the whole sutta, okay? So if anyone should develop these four foundations of mindfulness in such a way for seven years, 
one of two fruits could be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, or if there is a trace of clinging left, non-return. So that's an arahat or an anagami, okay? Let alone seven years, if anyone should develop the four foundations of mindfulness in such a way for six years, for five years, for four years, for three years, for two years, or for one year, one or two fruits could be expected to him, either final knowledge here and now, or if there is a trace of clinging left behind, uh, non-return. Okay, same thing, if the same phrases. Let alone one year, if anyone should develop these four foundations of mindfulness in such a way for seven months, six months, five months, four months, three months, two months, one month, that's four weeks, for half a month, that's um, two weeks, one of two fruits would be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, or if there's a trace of clinging left behind, now return. Let alone half a month, if anyone should develop these foundations of mindfulness in such a way for seven days, one or two fruits could be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, or if there's a trace of clinging left behind on return, he would close the book always and say, okay, you got 10 days, what's holding you up? <laughs> See, that's what he would do in every retreat. So it was in reference to this that it was said, this is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana, namely the four foundations of mindfulness. And when I go back and, and I study this, okay, um, the principal thing I can see throughout the whole each one of the practices is at the core, at the root point, is this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. And so the atta of going, embracing the atta as fully as possible to apply to absolutely the anatta, I'm sorry, the anatta to everything, the impersonal, you have to embrace the impersonal perspective and constantly correct yourself and constantly train the mind. That's not right. That's not impersonal. That's my opinion. Here's the impersonal. You have to keep doing that and doing it and doing it to train the mind to always go to the impersonal perspective. You see, in the whole entire journey to train it. That just because we talk about how to train mind. Okay. But you can look at this and you can discuss the front part where you're talking body feeling uh, mind and dhammas that's what it's about isn't it that's exactly what's there you can go in your book and find it okay when you go to the four noble truths you're examining uh that you you know if you had the terminology correct you know that with the four noble truths you're always moving to the total impersonal nature of everything and you are getting out of the way to free the mind, to open the mind. That's the practice of anatta. And then it goes through the aging and death and the birth and the clinging. All of these are coming back to right view. And what do we explain? Right view is harmonious perspective. And any book you get on right view will be proved out by practicing the four steps of right effort, which takes you to anatta pure and simple okay so i uh, then this goes into the six twelve base talks about consciousness and all that and um in each uh, section yeah it's uh you're looking so the person that is the very diagnosing diagnostic analytical person engineer spaceman <laughs> He's going to analyze and analyze and analyze and analyze and analyze and hope the cows will come home. Okay, not go out and bring them home for the milking, just hope that they'll come home is another way of saying it. He's just going to keep analyzing, doesn't do any good. Because the real thing is going back to the reality of I am not there. And then thinking of this. As the, as the my, how can I free the brine? What was he really going after? 
Well, once he started playing with us and he saw how to take things personally, it's a complete disaster. And, you know, Alex disagrees with me. Sarma disagrees with us, but Paul likes it. And then we've got fighting and infighting between us and then the neighbors, then the town, then the city, then the country. And then it's the world. And then pretty soon the spacemen come. They don't want to land. You know, they're fighting against them. You know, And everybody's, why? Why? Because nobody's willing to really sit down and communicate in a way that is totally and completely dedicated to an impersonal perspective and a non-interest thing. If it's hard to get everybody into a non-interest thing because everybody wants something, don't they? See, it's difficult. But but his curiosity, I'm just talking about Siddhartha's curiosity was what is the potential of the brain without the weight of all this on top of everything? What, what is the, uh, what is the uh, outcome if you don't have any pressure on the brain at all? And when you go to talk to Rene, at Re Rene's special Bharat, because he has 76 brains, <laughs> some of them still operating in bottles, you know? He, he, I saw his brains, it was interesting. And he's at that medical school where we were gonna do the research and he's a brain specialist, you know? And the thing, it's a crazy thing. This is really crazy, you know, because this is all about letting go. And they want to know in research of consciousness and everything, what are they doing it for? Oh, they're doing it for outer space. They're doing it for robotics um, and um, Android development and uh, space travel. That's what they're really doing it for. And they're looking ahead 50 to 70 years. That's what they're looking for. And I don't know what they know that I don't know, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm very happy this way, you know? But the whole thing is that uh, what is the potential of the brain with no pressure, no tension, no tightness on it at all? This is Perel's department. When she's in touch with all the different disorders and all the different things that can mentally oppress the person and make them feel bad, what's inside that's triggering the whole thing? What triggers craving? He did leave that for us to figure out. You see, he didn't, he's marvelous the way, you know, the cause of suffering is craving. Craving is nothing unless it gets ignited. So what ignites it? I do. That's why the craving is the, I like it, want it and attachment this way, or I don't like it, I don't want it. And aversion this way so that's funny because the, i don't know if you ever saw that or not i don't know if i have a big coin here well i can do it with this you know here you go okay this is this is um craving it's like um <clears throat> two sides of one coin and you'll say this is the coin so it's two sides of one coin this is a i like it uh, i want it attachment and this over here is i don't like it i don't want it aversion which means we turn it over because I want to make it stop. <laughs> and then you fight with the truth. And when it's a disease that is honest in the body or chemical, chemically caused in the depressive disorders, it's a frightful thing to see somebody really, really try to fight it when they can't win, see? And then they have to go into another level of existence, of acceptance or balancing, but in mo majority, you tell me if I'm right, Pharrell, but the majority, wide majority, when you measure depressive disorders is not above a five. You're on a scale of one to 10, and it's one, you know, one, two, three, four, and five, it's mostly below five. It's above five, six, they're the one, uh, below that, they're gonna take their medication, they're gonna stabilize themselves. If you're lucky and the doctor's nice, they're gonna work with you and they'll take the medication and stay on the program, okay? And they'll probably work balancing things out. Where I come in with this is different from Bonte. Bonte doesn't wanna see you take anything, but I've been in the system and I understand it because I was in advocacy for four years with people helping them and they have to take the drugs to stabilize the serious point so that they can hear you and be taught the rest of the information they need to have. The sad part is when the doctor doesn't cooperate with the, with the patient sometimes, and in the United States, you have a group of five, you're lucky if you get one that's gonna cooperate with this, you making the decision each step of the way. And uh, in the United States with advocacy, it was 
oh, just horrible. Four of them are telling you, you Poulton, what you will do, or we will take the money away that supports you. You will do what I say. And that's really destructive because for the depressive disorder person with the depressive disorder, their main desire in life is to be able to live independently again. See? And they're in a horrible position because when this goes wrong and the people around you, they don't like the way you're behaving. They want you on a drug to control you for the sake of them, not for you. And then people, the countries get involved in, well, let's put them all over here. And the funny part of that is let's put all the depressed people in the same housing development together. It's really fun at home, <laughs> you know? And so you put them all in the same development and what are they going to? what are they going to mimic? What are they going to copy? What's going to happen to them if all they have is a bunch of depressed people in the same place and nobody gets better? Nobody. Everybody's feeding off of everybody. It's really horrible. They have to be able to be able to function. And the drugs have come a long way now, but the cooperation between the doctors and the patients need to be protected so that the the patients in depressive disorders are not overrun by forceful doctors any more than when you have to go to jail and I have to handle your legal case that the public defendant doesn't have permission to just run over you and make decisions without you even knowing what's going on. That's what I was having to deal with. And then take them into the judge and say, look, this guy, he can't answer himself. He has to have an advocate. And we have to give him one all the time in every meeting he has with you or the, or the, or the, uh, the attorney. And somebody has to sit with him afterwards and make sure he understands everything that's happening to him because he doesn't understand. It's, it was pathetic, you know. It was, it was real interesting to work with that. So where I am with it is they need to be stabilized. And then you can say, let's teach them meditation a lot of times without uh, the drugs, okay, or the we at least want the doctors to say that they are not playing with the drug companies saying, oh yeah, I got him on this for life. We don't want them playing that game. From the depressive disorder point of view, we want to be able to take something that we can eventually balance ourselves out and function very well and live in life, you see? And different countries have different ways. You know, the UK was way ahead of the United States with this, I think, in support of the patient's development. Now I don't know where it is. I lost track of it years back. You um, know? I've got a question. Um, yeah. I've, I've got um, uh, someone who's approached me to help them, who I, I've known uh, teaching yoga and uh, that, and they've made a multiple uh, suicide attempts. And uh, they're on a, a regime of medication. Um, they were being looked after and being seen um, each day. Uh, then they were being phoned each day. Uh, and then, got some feedback, sorry. Uh, Can you this? Okay. And then, um, and, and then they were just being phoned once a week. Um, and oh, I'm just going to have to switch this one off for a moment. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, man, this is uh, okay. Um, uh, with the, uh, um, and they were then making, um, still making um, uh, suicide attempts with overdose and, but they were phoning up after the overdose. Uh, so they were still being um, seen. The care system seems to have completely let them down in terms of they're not under uh, medicated care. Uh, they've got medication. Um, they've come to me because uh, I've worked with other people they know uh, and they're, they're keen to uh, work with the meditation. Um, but uh, again, I, I talked to them about a week ago. We started uh, uh, 
uh, we uh, started the session, that went okay. Uh, then I didn't hear anything and they've made another attempt. So we've got this cycle of uh, attempted suicide. But um, what I want to know, what I, want to know I would want to know first, what else is in his life? What's he doing with himself, you see? Well, it's, it's a woman that she's not able to uh, do her normal work because she doesn't feel able to. It doesn't count anymore. Can she get on the computer? Um, well, she's on her own. Uh, her only child is uh, now left the university. Um, how, old, how old is she? I would say early 50s. Um, and she's been in what we call here a bubble, uh, which is because of the coronavirus. And she's had a bubble of one, just herself. Well, a lot of the suicide attempts that are going on in the United States right now are being provoked by COVID lockdowns. There's no question about this. One of the strongest solutions for, um, you, you probably do know what level she is on the scale for her depression. Uh, I don't know what her, uh, her scale result is. She was only prepared to, to share a certain amount she, of information. It's not necessarily probably over five if she's doing all that. She's probably over five or six or probably six or maybe she's not seven or eight because seven or eight, she's usually like trying to threaten other people and it's out of control, but, but not reasoning at all and stuff. Now, one of the things that's really sad is that I don't know how close the doctor is to, to checking on the the monitoring the system of drugs that she's using sometimes they give you the drugs and they expect you to tell them what's going on they need to be one of the things that happened a long time ago you remember um what's it that you take um, i can't remember the name of it it can re it can start happening in your system again um and everybody takes it when they're in in uh, bipolar disorder you know they start by taking it but the problem was the old pills, the old medication lithium. they gave you, what was is, it? Is it lithium? lithium? Yes, lithium. See, lithium had these big side effects that either made you terrifically fat or terrifically thin. In my case, it made me terrifically thin. I was delighted, okay? But I managed to, um, the problem with taking the drugs, and I don't know, Perel can comment on this, but in, in the United States, they're required to give you a piece of paper that is um, this size, like um, half of half of this, like this, this big, okay? When, if you're hospitalized and they start putting you on drugs, they're required to give you a paper this size with about a 16 font, 16 or 18 font, really big and bold information for six or seven possible side effects when they tell you about a drug they're putting you on in the hospitals, okay? That's all they're required to do, okay? And uh, you look at that, you, you're supposed to make an agreement with your doctor, yeah, I'll start on this drug, okay? And the problem is that with lithium, they didn't tell me the truth about the whole thing. And when I went, our, our system, you know, with the support group that we had, okay, I was lucky because my advocate said, well, did you write the company yet? I said, I didn't write the company. We'll write the company and find out who made the drug and, and ask them for the whole thing about the research for the drug and about all of the possible side effects. So my story was very sad. I made a promise to stay on lithium for one year, okay? It's, it's good and it's bad. I stayed on it, but I pushed my way through 11 of 22 possible side effects when in the hospital, I was told there were only six. It was devastating. Now, lithium can be devastating because when you walk, you walk like you're 103, your legs can shake all over. I couldn't write my name for a month or uh, probably three months. I couldn't write my name except shaking the whole time. I had to hold my hand just to sign my name. My hair fell out. I had lumps under my arms. I bled. I had all kinds of ridiculous side effects from this thing that were not on the thing at the hospital and they, they don't, they're just not responsible. And so, but I stayed on it and I was a freaky case because at the end of that year, I finally had a meeting with him again. And I said, look, here's the deal. I'm settling for quality of life decisions and not drug decisions anymore. So I said, I'm gonna go off it. But he said, let's see one more thing here. And I said, okay, you've been on it a year, but let's run the blood test. He was very good. He, we were doing the blood test every six weeks, isn't it? Six weeks, I think you have to do the blood test. Most of the doctors, when I became an advocate later, they weren't even running their blood tests on these things. And that's the most dangerous thing. So you have a person on two or three of these drugs and then 
you don't catch what's going on with pushing them, peaking them, they're, they're getting peaked, pushed toward suicidal attempts. So what is wrong with her drugs is the first thing is evaluate her drugs with a different doctor, maybe. If he's not keeping track of She's on a cocktail of three drugs. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, as far as I can work out, um, I mean, this has been going on for almost a year now. When uh, she has these suicidal attempts, do they change the levels on her drugs? No, not that she's described. They don't, they don't adjust them after the suicide attempts? Not that, not that she's described. And at the moment, uh, that's something that I will explore when she uh, comes back. Uh, she's you, in have be careful. No. you have to be careful. She's not lying to you. Really careful, you know, um, to find out what I know you're it's difficult, <laughs> you know, yeah. but to encourage her to if she was supposed to be getting blood tests that she make sure she get the blood test. The problem with lithium was if you didn't keep up with the drug test, you could get yourself uh, you're weaned onto it and then you take it and then um, you're supposed, well, I wrote the, <laughs> I wrote the creators of it to find out how to get off of it. And um, he said, well, just stop taking it. I said, no way, no way. I, I got all the information. I brought it and put it in front of the doctor. You can't just stop. If you were weaned on, you have to wean off. Otherwise, you might never be able to take it again if you need it. That's the trick with lithium. I'm right, right, Perel? Yeah, okay. And so I'm not, you know, not sure she's on lithium. Huh? I'm not sure that she's on lithium. It, it well, the problem that. with the combinations and cocktails they come up with, they have to be monitored very closely. If a person is trying to commit suicide repeatedly, one of the drugs, I forget the names now, but there were some that were going on, just a pinch more, and the person's trying to commit suicide all the time. My sister was affected by that. And I put my foot down and I said, I don't care if you want me to, I'm going to the doctor and tell him what's happening. This was a Zoloft thing and Zoloft can throw you that way or it can keep you over here very nicely. But if you want it to be more so you can lose weight or something, that's what was happening with Zoloft. People were marching and saying, we want to lose weight, put us on Zoloft. <laughs> it's crap, you know, but the, this was really sad what happened. Right now, over, uh, I had a ridiculous figure. I can tell you what it was. I have it right in front of me. Um, I had a ridiculous figure on, on depressive disorders, was talking to a friend that's still doing advocacy. And the level on the United States for taking <coughs> drugs for the um, depressive disorders has gone through the roof, absolutely through the roof. This is where uh, we are with, um, wait a minute. Suicide spike for the young people in America has gone off the charts on the ceiling. Teenage suicides, desperation of not being able to be in, you know, uh, high school, freshman, sophomore, junior, mm -hmm. and senior on time. The stress of that, just unbelievably. You have 18 million unemployed people, mental health with 40 million people on antidepressants in our country. 40 wow. million now. That's, That's like 15% of the population. Much, much higher than it used to be. It used to be, um, well, I don't know, but they, okay, the suicide spike, the biggest one is with young people and um, yeah, the rest of it is stuff, other, other kind of stuff. That's going on, but I just. Well, my, my question, my question is, um, yeah. when I am able to, because at the moment I can't meet face to face, so we're doing this uh, over over Zoom. Um, what what from your experience is the most constructive way to to uh, um, encourage her to work? If you were in COVID, the first thing I always say to somebody who is it's a depressive disorder. So how can you get the person to move over to stay with the other side all the time and train their mind that that's where they wanna be? So what you do is if the person is a depressive disorder and they can read, you find somebody who can't read and you get them to go help the person by reading to them. You help them, put them in volunteer positions where they're helping another human being. And what we've done right now with this is like we're killing people because of keeping them in lockdown. Honestly, we're killing them. And I see, I, I think our street here is very adjusted. Uh, and I think India has been through 
lots of epidemics over the time and they understand what this is about. They're not fighting against it. Uh, but, you know, people are cooperating, but I don't, the problem is that they're getting, they get cocky about the masks. They don't understand the whole principle of the masks, you know, um, and that's difficult. But the point is they're cooperating. They're trying to cooperate in our colony. They're really trying to cooperate. And it's up to the different areas where they live. And for the Dalits, they are in colonies with 200 to 500 families in each colony, you see. And um, so it's up to how they're cooperating with each other. And these are very good people. They're, they're doing pretty good, I think. But <clears throat> normally what I say to a person is, and Bhante says to a person too, they have to start giving, get away from sitting in the past. And then you have, if you want to do something constructive, you, you teach them the thing that we're developing them for the new, for tomorrow's talk with the past and the future and the present, that lesson. Yeah. But you yeah. remember that you can't teach them, especially if they're in depression. They have to, you have to, they have to tell you out of their mouth what past means and what future means. And mm -hmm. They have we, we, we went through that in the first session. Yeah. Yeah. And so we 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 um that's a balancing program that I always use before I teach dependent origination workshops. They have mm -hmm. to have that training first to make themselves try to equalize a little bit to mm -hmm. understand. And then I present the dependent origination. So they understand that, uh, well, I had the Vasudhi Maga now and the Vasudhi Maga diagram in this back of the book, you know, and in the back of the book, um, it's divided into three parts or three lifetimes. The little diagram is in the back of the book. So the past has to do with ignorance and formations and mm -hmm. the present time life is consciousness, mentality, materiality, the sixfold base, contact, and feeling. And then, then there's a line, and then that's rebirth process becoming five results. But see, the thing is, we don't look at the last part of the chart. <laughs> and then the next part is craving, clinging, and becoming, or becoming is actually bawa. You know, that's where your um, habitual emotional reactions are, sitting in a big cluster in there and then you have the birth but not this is not we don't talk about it as the birth of a being we're talking to you to teach you about phenomena we're yeah. car carrying it over saying he was teaching this as a tool so we're taking you from sixfold base um to this the six sense stories into contact feeling craving clinging um the, the uh, habitual tendencies and the birth of reaction. And we're trying to show you how the power of it happens and pushes the wheel around. My insidious thing was asking all the monks, how does the wheel turn? Why did you choose a, a wheel? Why didn't you choose a square? <laughs> I was doing all kinds of funny things, but you know, if it's a wheel, what makes it push? Mm. And the solution is to tell them, that when you have the um, a key and you get in your car, you put it in the ignition, that's contact, mm. okay? And when you turn the key and the engine starts, you have feeling happen. You can feel the vibration of the car, right? Then when craving hits, I don't like this. That is like first gear. And you first gear in a car, it jerks forward, like with tightness. That's all the reason you have only reason you have first gear in a car is to get the wheels rolling. You don't drive in first gear, okay? And then clinging is second gear, which makes everything go faster, doesn't it? When you start telling stories in your head about why you don't like it, it starts with more power. And then the, the habitual tendencies are sitting there and you we're habitually reaching for the reaction that is most similar to the situation, which comes from where? The past. So we better have told you that the balancing story first, so you get clear how it is to reach in the bucket and pull out a reaction that's coming from the past that's dead and it's over and it has no energy in it anymore. Why are you doing this? You start to say to yourself, why am I doing that? 
and you and the person says I don't want to reach in there to do just live a life of reaction, reaction, reaction. But by then what's happening in second gear, you're getting faster. And when you go into get that habitual tendency, you're going down the ramp and you're going to go on the highway. And at the birth of reaction, it's like you hit 70 miles an hour, 60 kilometers or whatever it is on the highway to be driving with everybody else as fast as you can. <laughs> and then suddenly, Something happens and you run out of gas and you're on the side of the road by yourself and you try to call somebody to get more gas or get help, but something happens. You left the house without plugging the phone in and you haven't got anything. So what have you got? Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. That's what you've got because you've got to flag somebody down and get them to stop to help you. You see, you're caught. So what I'm trying to show you is that's like the motion of how the suffering is working. Now with her, with the person, they're feeding this constant thing of reaching in there for the past reaction, reaction, reaction. They're just rolling without sitting down and saying, well, what's your reaction? She has to keep a notebook. My students are always told you have to keep a notebook. You have to find what it is that is the killing stone. And it is the reaction that you do over and over and over again that ruins the relationship with this one, that one, this one, and that one, and everybody else. See, that's it. So you have to find that reaction and see it first. Then you have to stop living in reaction. And then you, what you usually happens is they say, well, when I'm in clinging, I, all I do is my, my mind just runs and runs and runs about, we'll stop doing that. So now all you've got left is you've got craving, right? Okay, craving, you can say, I don't like it. Well, you can say, I don't like to say, I don't like it anymore. I'm gonna look at it more impersonally. <laughs> and then you can start, to change. You can't give up craving completely. I'm not going to tell you a story. The Arahat's the only one that gets rid of the craving permanently, but you can reduce it by understanding how this is all operating. That's the thing. You can stop the wheel from actually moving almost. You can way slow it down because you gave up bursting out in the birth of reaction and you gave up the Re the old reaction, you realize you're just going to lock up the library and try to choose something here and now in this time to do in the situation. And then the one before that was clinging. I'm not going to listen to that in my head anymore. I'm going round and round about that. So you give up the storyline thing. And then you're only dealing with identifying. And then where are you? Then you're just in a spot where you train yourself to never mind this and just let go, relax, smile, and come back and keep doing it. Let go, relax, smile, and come back. Never mind, let go, relax, smile, and come back is not anything Buddhist. Here, I take my robes off. I'm not, you know, it's not Buddhist. It's human. The human being can be changed and changed to habitual tendency. My, my question for you is, do you know about enough about this person? You see, that's the thing. You know. Well, I, I can only know uh, what she chooses to tell me. And that's, that's a bummer. Only thing as, you know, as an advocate, the only thing, if that's all that can happen is to send her, to ask her questions about her doctor or how many times did she attempt suicide? And you know, it's interesting. She said she attempt, attempted suicide four times. Yeah, you know, see, you know, think about attempting suicide. Who does it affect? Who's, who's left behind every time? Do you know mm. about her family at all? As she has one daughter. Ooh, ouch, big time. Well, ouch, cruel, gosh, really bad. <laughs> um, suicide's a strange thing. It's one of the most selfish things that can possibly happen because of the people who are left behind and the damage that happens for them is a whole new story, a whole, a whole other story, see? And um, it's cruel, like uh, my, my second husband's wife um, used to do it all the time. And it was one of the things that destroyed, had things to do with destroying this, the marriage I had to him because I had to deal with her, her children every time that happened because they were living with us. And it was treacherous, you know, uh, because of the people that are left behind. And the reality is if you really want to kill yourself, um, Bonte's kind of cold about it. You ought to just do it. 
<laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say it to somebody, but honest to gosh, if you're going to, if you really want to leave, well, then leave. See? Because you can't save her and she's using this suicide thing. It's obvious four times in a row, something's going on. Mm -hmm. okay. why, is she, why is she living independently and continuing to commit suicide? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, in her 50s, there's a, a lot of stuff she could try to do online to, uh, to help people. She could, I still think there's more in there than I know. I don't have time to look around, but I'm sure there is because I'm sure there are ways to volunteer to help people online too. Mm -hmm. You know, not just in person. I'm sure we didn't give it all up. They must be doing something to help with contact with people. The biggest thing right now in the whole world is being able to have people be in contact with other human beings and not isolated. Yep. Except for monks. Just leave them alone. <laughs> you know, we're okay. just happy. <laughs> you know, we well, just well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um yeah. uh, She's, um, she does describe sometimes, you know, being very uh, completely numb and just having critical thoughts going through and is really doesn't quite- Perel, Perel, in, doesn't it sound like it's one of the drugs in the, in the, in the, um, one of the drugs in the, the combo, you know, whatever it is, the, one of the drugs that's in the, the, <laughs> what did you call it? The, the cocktail. Yeah, the cocktail. It's one of the drugs in the cocktail that's off base. Because my sister, when she, I don't remember what it was, but I was really mad at that doctor. Um, and I kept going to her and saying, look, you've got to figure this out. And she had it at a very, Libby, but the problem with Libby was she was cheating. She was trying to use the Zoloft in order to lose weight. That's what she was trying to do. But she needed it, but she only needed like this much. And she wanted that much because she wanted to lose weight. And I'm there, you got to get over this. This is just ridiculous to fool around with this drug because I knew about it. And the thing was, she would go towards wanting to commit suicide. Okay. And then they cut it back and she'd be just as fine as anything. See, these drugs are different than the ones we grew uh, I grew up with. Um, they're much more sensitive, much more sensitive. And the degrees of the mixing this cocktail and stuff, that's why I can't understand if she's really going through suicides, why aren't they re-examining which one of the pieces in the cocktail is pushing her at the same proximate time of taking it too? If you looked on a calendar, you might find it was happening within four weeks each time or something. How, yeah. how four times in what length of time? Um, 12 months. Oh, wow. That's quarterly. Three months and then well, back. The last, the last time, uh, the last time was uh, a week ago. And the time before that was four weeks before that. And then I think it was December and then August, something like that. Yeah, that's all I can tell you. I don't know, but she needs to. Um, okay, as far as me being more down to earth with meditation as a teacher, she needs to be practicing gratitude every night. She needs to be keeping a little notebook, get her a little notebook and tell her to write down three things every night before she goes to bed that she's grateful for. These can be, make sure she understands it can be tiny, like I remembered to buy the toilet paper. I mean, it can be yeah. anything, you know, <laughs> over here, that's, you know, I, not important anymore, but, but um, it can be any little tiny thing, you know, that I'm grateful for, the gratitude. And then what she does is she does three each day in a, no, a little notebook. It can be just a small notebook the size of your phone. And then at the bottom on Sunday, she sits there and she reads them back to herself. And then she does the next week and the next week and see how, get her, see if she'll do it. Some people aren't going to do it. Some people are on some kind of a cycle um, of this and there's no yeah. way to help them except to level and up. Drugs. How often would you recommend being in contact? Whoa, <laughs> that's a big, that's a loaded question. I don't know. 
Um, is she coming weekly or what is she doing? Uh, well, uh, it's again, it's on Zoom. It was weekly. Um, but I'm wondering if it, it would be useful uh, in the early stages to do maybe uh, two sessions a week or three sessions a week. So she's got a reference point to come to. Oh, you want to do something on Zoom with her? We're, I'm doing Zoom. That, we can't meet. Uh, we can't meet face to face. So I didn't get the question. I'm not clear. Um, at the moment, we're 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 meeting weekly on Zoom. Yep. But I'm wondering whether, because of where she is, whether it would be more helpful to meet more often than weekly to give her a reference point in the early stages. Well, if you want to do it twice a week to help her so she has somebody to talk to, sure. Mm -hmm. Just, um, I don't I don't know what else to tell you. What do you think, Perez? No, I'm, I, I appreciate that that's, uh, that's part, part, of, uh, part of the challenge here. Um, I mean, giving her support is, an, you know, a couple times a week is really a good thing to help her. Yeah. It's almost, you know, it's almost like I feel like somebody, I have a program where there's a, a phone tree where people are at least in contact with other human beings because in this whole thing, everybody's getting so isolated, you know? Yeah. Well, I think she feels enormously isolated. And, uh, uh, and we're lucky in the sense that next week, the rules change here and she'll be able to uh, meet other people. Um, but it's it's been it's been deeply challenging. Um, okay, um, I had, I did have another question, but we'll we'll hold that one over for another time. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. All right. So we've got a break. I think. Does anybody have a question anywhere? Alex, are you happy? I don't know where Alex went. Okay. He's happy. Okay. I'm <laughs> just checking. Uh, how are you doing, Paul? Are you okay? Yes, yes I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. Good, good, good. I'm glad everybody's okay. So let's say our prayer. Okay. May suffering, suffering one, one be suffering, suffering free and, and the fears shed. Fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief. And may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, space and earth devas and nagas of vital power, share this may, they, may they long, may they long protect, protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. sadhu.